Jeopardy. No. Jeopardy is still on, isn't it? Yeah. Paper. I don't have a pen. I gave my one pen away. Wait, are we doing the answers and trying to find the? You have to give you. Have, you know, you have to give it in the form of a question. In the form of a question. Form of a question. You have to say what is. Thanks. I mean, okay, go ahead. Uh, what is an uh, what is an ball act? Well, you know, I suppose can you, an example yeah. would be yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the question that goes to that answer, but you needed to save the question for later. That's all. She gave it another example, like you know, oh, bananas. Like right? that's that okay, that's 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 the answer. Bananas. Oh. The question would be, what do monkeys like to eat? That's okay. I got one right. <laughs> Better get your hand up fast for that one. Okay. All right. Number two, an attribute of God that we do share with him. What is righteousness? You got the first attributes of God that we do share with him. You have the first three words right. <laughs> okay, number three. God is unchangeable. Number four, God fills every point of time and space with the entirety of his being. Number five, God depends upon no one or no thing for his own being, nature, purpose, or plan. Number six. You'll get this, Stephen, you'll get it. It's just, I have no idea. <laughs> you, you, you actually know these answers. You know them all. All you have to do is say what Get back is here. in front of Right. Okay. What is powerful? Close. 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 Yep. It's not being such a moral Are we up to six now coming up? Yeah, I'm coming up to six. The four characteristics of Scripture. Let me see if you get this one. Unchangeable? No, 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 no. You hold on. Okay, hold on just a second. But I got another question before you should get this one. You're going to make all these people feel really comfortable this morning. You're going to really get that answer to this one. List the Ten Commandments in order. Can you do that? Yes. Right about And you can do a shorthand. You don't have to put out right the whole thing. What are the I got it. <laughs> Josh, you got that? So when I call on you for this question, you can stand up and you can recite them for me, right? All okay. ten. I'd make a comment about Mama's boy, but I won't be that mean. <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> yeah. I'll just imply it. Or 
important for them. Can you get these? Ten Commandments in order, so if I call on you, you can stand up and go right through the list for me. Because unless you're looking them up online, dude. <laughs> yeah, I didn't say this was a closed book test. See, Betty, there's most of the churches that I've been to, that wouldn't help them. If I said to you, you can you, you can open your Bible. They, even know where to look. they would not know where to look. Wow. Then again, those are Baptist churches. So. Okay, everyone got these then? Okay, we're playing theological jeopardy. And the first question I believe was attributes of God that we do not share. Okay, go ahead. Okay, what is incommunicable? What, what are, is what, what are incommunicable attributes? Okay, see how that works, Stephen, now? All you're doing is that you give the answer in the form of a question. Okay? But again, if you've never seen Jeopardy, then that probably doesn't make any sense. But Jeopardy is, like, that's the longest game show in history, isn't it? I mean... I'm not wondering the price is right. The price is right. Is price is right still on? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's still on. Actually, my, my cousin kind of introduced me to this, and because she was babysitting my two other cousins and one summer across the street, and you know, so we used to hang out and you know talk and stuff. And she would always watch Jeopardy, which was on in the afternoon in those days. And so she thought she was pretty smart, and I had never watched Jeopardy before. So we, every time we got one right, we would write down the dollar amount, and then it was a contest at the end. Well, I smoked it. <laughs> How do you know that stuff? Susie, I read. You know, yeah. it's like it's not rocket science. Yes. What is eternal? The amount of time that Pastor Brian speaks <laughs> on Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Question number two. Attributes of God that we do share with him. Go ahead, Steve. What is communicable? Well, or what are to the communicable are attributes? Yep, yeah, okay, that's fine. You don't lose any points for the grammar not being quite right there. Um, okay, um, I, this is Peg where you get, to, you get to embarrass me in public. I forget which question I asked first there. Okay. What, what is the, the unchangeable attribute? You asked the, the description. Okay. All right. So it means unchangeable. Okay. Well, the, the question was, what is an immutable Right. What is immutability? Yeah, right. That's, the that's the answer. Yeah. In the form of a question, which is why Stephen is getting, going, this is crazy. It's messing with my head. And God fills every point of time and space the entirety of his being. Listen to this, Jake. God fills every point of time and space the entirety of his being. What is infinity? What is infinity? The infinity of God is that he fills every point of time and space with all of his being. So there's no place where God isn't. There's no time where God isn't. God is right here present with us right now. He's also right there present with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He's also right there with all the saints at the end of time. And for him, it's one big now. God doesn't experience past, present, or future. He is not subject to time. He rules over it. Okay? Uh, God depends upon no one or nothing for his own being, substance, nature. Yes, Stephen. What is, uh, what is independence? What is his independence? Very good. And then uh, I think I gave the fourth. Because I actually, I, did I give you guys no? Yeah. Yeah. God has no passions, divisions, or parts. What is? Unity. Unity. Oh, Very unity? good. Okay. Good. And uh, digging myself in a post can be digging. I think the next one went right to um, the, four, the four characteristics of Scripture. Snap. Remember that. Write that down. S N A C. Because you're going to get this in the next week. You're going to come back. S N. Okay. So, anyone want to start? The four characteristics of scripture. 
what is the sufficiency? What is sufficiency? Yes. What is, what is the necessity? What is unchangeable? Mm, nice try. So remember snack. S N A C. So we've got the S, and we've got an N. Now we need an A and a C. Okay. What is authority? What is authority? What is clarity? What is clarity? Or or who was it last week that said perspicuity? Um, snap. <laughs> yes. I know. I'd have to come up with a whole new. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can't come up with a with a better uh, structural basis for it. Okay. So the proper answer would be: What is sufficiency, necessity, authority, and clarity? The four essential characteristics of scripture. And then Ten Commandments. Number one, Josh. What's the first commandment? Oh, 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 oh. Daniel. Daniel. What's the first commandment? You shall. Oh, I failed this year. <laughs> we studied that in school, too. You shall not. You shall not. You shall not make statues. Yeah, close, but not, not, not quite. Jake, want to take a swing at it? Uh, huh? You shall not have any other gods before you. shall have no other gods. We're out of the ballpark. Okay. <laughs> Steve, okay. Well, Stephen, what's the second one? Okay. Thou shalt not make any statues. Thou shalt not make statues. No graven images, okay? We can use the short form here. The third commandment then is. Come on, someone has some excuse. That's what I'm going to say for the Lord's name. Henry, third commandment. Whoa. We just said that. Pay attention. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Very good. Okay, good. No, you know, you know, no blasphemy. Okay. Fourth commandment. Fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Okay, all the kids together, what is the fifth commandment? If you don't know anyone else, I know you know this one. Thou Go ahead, Josh. Josh, it's Josh. Is your name Josh? Stephen, is your name Josh? <coughs> Josh. What is it, Caleb? Who shall obey your father and mother? Well, honor your father and mother. Father and mother. Father and mother. I said who that way too. Oh, okay. You got to honor your father and mother. Okay, I thought that's the one that every every kid here would have heard okay. so many times. Honor your father and mother. Okay. Wait, so you don't have to obey them? You just have to honor them? Children, obey your parents and the Lord, because this is right. So yeah, you too, sorry. Yeah, honor is a bigger word than obey. And it's a much more important word. If we were doing the thing on the Ten Commandments, uh, we would explore the implications. But the word to honor has a far greater significance and has an idea of more than just, you know, complying with commands, but basically getting behind whatever the authority is. But that's a different topic. Sixth commandment. No, yeah, Stephen. Yeah. No, Kevin. Okay, seventh commandment. No adultery. No adultery. Excellent. Okay. Uh, well, eighth commandment. Yes. You shall not steal. Oh, no stealing. Right. Okay, ninth commandment. Come on, God. Sorry? He's going to let other people do it. Oh, he's going to let other people do it. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Ninth commandment. Not there. Also. No lying. Yeah. yeah. And actually, we really need, do need to be careful on that when we say, because it's not really no lying, it's no bearing false witness. And that's significantly different. But, but again, we'll talk about that some other time in the future. And the Tenth Commandment is, yes. You shall not commit adultery, but you shall not steal your... your, your I know where you're thoughts. coming from. You shall not steal your neighbor's whatever. That's right. <laughs> you shall not steal... You shall not cover your neighbor. You shall not covet. Right, that's the one. That thing, thou shalt not covet. Okay, all right, good. Okay, let's uh, let me pass these out here. Uh, thanks to Chris Valtano. Uh, these are for readers. You can look on with your brother. And uh, 
Kayla, pass us back. Chris, Chris, I'll come up with us up. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you for your glorious gift of salvation. Father, we thank you for all things that you've given us. Lord, you are light, and in you there is no darkness at all. And Father, we praise you and glorify you that you choose to magnify, to use us as a means of, uh, of sharing that light. And we praise you, Father, that you've given us that light in your world. So as we consider the things of your kingdom and, and consider what you have revealed, give us grace and insight that we might understand more than just intellectually, but also, Father, the depths of our being, that we might give you the praise and honor and glory that is your due. Thank you, King Jesus, in your name. Amen. Okay, we've talked about the four essential characteristics of Scripture. We've used the acronym SNAC, S-N-A-C, and that comes from Jeremiah, where it says, Thy words were found, and I ate them, and thy word became for me a joy, and the delight of my heart, for I have been called by thy name, almost high. So we use that kind of connection there, that God's word is special, it's food, it's sweet, it's wonderful, and it has four essential characteristics. It's sufficiency, it's all that we need to know, to know him and to glorify him. It's necessary for a certain knowledge of the gospel and for God's will. And I think we're picking up tonight with number three, authority, that all the words of Scripture are God's word. Now, first of all, let's uh, do a little bit of background just for, for a moment here. The word Scripture in Greek is the word graphe, and it's used in the New Testament. Remember, numbers don't always resonate well in my head, but, so I'm in the ballpark if I'm not exactly correct. I think it's something like 57 times in the New Testament. So you can get out, if you go home tonight and you look up your Strong's or your Young's Concordance, and you look at the word graphe, and you see how many times it's used, you'll find if you actually count the number of times it's there in the Concordance, uh, and you usually have a Strong's, a Young's that I think, because it, it's, it's the word itself that's being written. It's always used, it means writings, basically in Greek, and in the New Testament, it's almost universally, I think, I can't think of a single instance where it isn't, you used to refer to the Bible. So what we call the word, the Bible, is, Jake, where does the word Bible come from? What does it mean? Any idea? Book. Very good, yes. It's the Greek word for book. It's biblios. And it simply means book. And therefore, this book was called the book because it was, in fact, the very first book. Did you know that? The Bible is the very first book that was ever made. Now, there were writings, obviously, before the scriptures were written. There was writings before the Bible. But in the old days, the way that they normally did it is that they had scrolls that were long pieces of parchment. And by the word, you ever heard the word canon? C-A-N-O-N. The word canon refers to the accepted standard. Okay? Uh, Jack will appreciate this, Nick Henry. In games and, and or in fantasy series, you have a canon, which means these are the actual events that, that happened. Other things that may have happened in the series, but they're not canon, then they're only alternatives. The word canon means standard. And it actually basically it comes from another Greek word, which means a reed, which was a certain length, which became the standard of measurement. And so the way that they used to do it, they used to take papyrus, which is a reed that grew, in the, especially in the Nile Delta, and they would beat these papyrus plants down and spread them out. And uh, basically they would create, you know, these sheets that were fairly uniform. And they would dry them in the sun in one long piece, and they would roll them up. And that's the only source of paper they pretty much had in the ancient world. They, sometimes they wrote on vellum, which is parchment that's made from sheep, and they wrote on some other substances. But during the time of the New Testament, they used to write on this papyri, a papyrus, which came in long rolls. Well, obviously, if you've got you know, a long roll of paper that's rolled up, think about a, a toilet paper roll. There's a lot of paper on that roll, isn't it? And if you want to look at something that's at the end of the roll, you'd have to unroll the whole thing, wouldn't you, to get to the end. So what they did is they had this long piece of papyrus, right? They would have a, 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 it would roll up from both ends. It would roll this way to let that in the middle. So that way it would make it easier to find something. You could open it up, right? But if they wrote the way that we do today, where you start at the top of the page and you work all the way over to the end of the page, well, since the, the papyrus might be six feet long, I'm not exactly sure what the object was, That'd be a pretty hard sentence to write, right? Six feet long. And you'd have to unroll the whole thing. And while you're looking at this end, this end would roll up. And while you're trying to get to the end of the sentence, you know, this and this end would roll up. So it'd be very hard to do that. 
So what they did is that very early on, what they learned to do is they wrote in columns. <clears throat> and the Hebrews especially were very good at writing <clears throat> down the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, when they translated into Greek, to make sure, and, and when they wrote, actually wrote in Hebrew, to make sure that they wrote, there were a certain number of characters per line. And so those columns, they wrote the columns, so as you unroll the document, you could basically follow, you could start at one end, you could start following, you could read a column, you know, read left to right or right to left, depending with your Greek or Hebrew, and then you could follow it. And so they had these individual columns that were placed together. So eventually, somebody, when the scriptures actually were finished writing, somebody came up with the idea of taking those columns, right, taking that big long scroll, and you'd have like, through the New Testament, there's what, uh, how many books in the New Testament? Yeah. Well, you'd have 27 scrolls that you'd have to read through. Can you imagine, you know, everyone turn to your scroll number, you know, on your, you know, can you imagine coming to Bot Church with your Bible with like arms full of scrolls? It'd be kind of embarrassing. Somebody had the idea of chopping up those columns like this, right? Separating them and then laying them one on top of each other and binding the whole thing together. And that's called a codex. And I've actually been to the British Museum in London, and I've actually seen like the Codex Sinaiticus, which is one of the earliest Bibles that we've got. It's from around, what, Sam, 5th century, I think, isn't it? Sinaiticus? Yeah. And it's really cool, because they've got it under glass, and you can actually see this Bible that's like 1,500 years old. And if you learn Greek, you can actually read that Bible. That's 50, and that's like really cool. I mean, it's not quite like reading the original documents, but it's very close to it. And like, when you go in, you know, they'll change the pages every every so often. So every time we went down to the British Museum back in the 70s, you see a new page, you know, it's like, wow, you know, it's, it's really kind of cool. So the Bible actually became the first book that was ever made, and that's why its name is became Daniel. But actually, technically speaking, it's not really the Bible. The proper name for it would be the Graphe the scriptures. And in the New Testament, the word graphe, or scriptures, always refers to the sacred writings, the writings that God himself gave. So all of us know, and you don't have to turn with this, but you want to mark it down or, or look at it on your, uh, on your notes there. Uh, one of the verses that almost every Christian knows and probably misunderstands is 2 Timothy 3.16, and it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And so when it says that all scripture, it's not talking about like, like everything that's ever been written, but it's referring to the fact that the word graphe itself refers to the sacred writings. There was a body of sacred writings which the New Testament church recognized as being authentic from God. All of those things were uh, given by inspiration of God. The word there in Greek is theonoustos. It means literally God breathe. God breathe these out. Now that's not the same as dictation. It's not like God said, okay, hey, John, okay, write this. In the beginning, and John writes, in the beginning, was the word, was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was with God, and the word was God. That's not how inspiration worked. But rather God in his grace and goodness and mercy and power work in and through the authors of Scripture to communicate his message. It's very clear in the Old Testament that there are differences between the various books, the way that they're written, their, uh, the style, the language, the use of grammar, and all those things scholars can know. But it doesn't change the fact that they were all breathed out. Paul said that Scripture, and by the way, when he's talking about Scripture here, he's literally talking about verse 15, and from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, <clears throat> which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Now he's talking about Timothy there, and he's saying, Timothy, since you were a child, you have known the Holy Scriptures. He's clearly not talking about the New Testament, because guess what? The New Testament was still in the process of being written. So the only Holy Scriptures would have been the Old Testament, would have been the books that we recognize today we call the Old Testament. And Paul says that you've known them, and they are sufficient to make you wise for salvation. Now, that's really mind-shattering when you think about it. The gospel is there in the Old Testament. It's all there. Now, granted, it, you know, we need to have supernatural illumination in order to see that gospel, but it's there. And that's 
really kind of an important point because a lot of our brothers out there and sisters in various other churches, when it comes to the Old Testament, they hate it. They're afraid of it. They don't like it. That's Old Testament, they'll say. It's no relevance for us. Jesus is about love and purity and kindness and tolerance and all that kind of stuff. And God in the Old Testament was angry and mean. Well, the gospel is there in the Old Testament. God hasn't changed. He cannot change because he is immutable. And so, therefore, since God has not changed, we ought to expect to see indications of his love, grace, mercy, compassion, and his redemptive plan for, for men. And the whole point of the New Testament is that Jesus is the sacrificial lamb that was required in Old Testament law in order to propitiate God's uh, uh, righteous judgment and to cover our sins and to save us from our sins. But the point is, is that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. This is something that we need to keep our minds around. Now, keeping our fingers just kind of here, I'm just going to go over for a second with a parallel verse, because even my theology professors uh, <clears throat> didn't uh, didn't always uh, 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 they didn't draw this connection, and maybe I'm a heretic for doing so. From Second Peter chapter three, listen to this. Now, this is the very end of the letter. Peter's wrapping things up. He says, "Therefore, beloved, looking for, forward to these things, be diligent to be found by him in peace, without spot and blameless." And listen to this. And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to you, has written, as also in all his epistles, speaking of them of these things, which are some things are hard to understand, and then which the untaught and unstable twist to their own destruction, <coughs> as they do also the rest of the scriptures, as the rest of the graphe. Now I think that's a pretty significant verse because what Peter is saying is, look guys, Paul's been writing about the same stuff. And as a lot of stuff he writes, it's hard to understand. And I don't know about you, but I actually find that probably one of the most comforting verses in the New Testament. Because if even Peter, who was discipled by the Lord for three years, was given supernatural gifts and signs and wonders, was the leader of the early church. He wasn't the first pope, but he was at least the leader of the early church. If even Peter could say, Paul writes some stuff that's really hard to understand, then that gives hope for poor old me, because there's lots of things I don't get. So there's an encouragement there. Okay? Just because it's true doesn't mean we'll always understand it. But the important thing is that Peter equates the writings of Paul with the sacred scriptures. The same authority that, that he... That Paul gives to, in 2 Timothy 3.16 to the Old Testament, Peter is now giving to Paul's writing in the New. Yes, ma'am. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. And verse 16 is the easy one. In fact, it's easy to remember because it's you know, 2 Timothy 3, you know, 16, 2 Peter 3.16. And, and that's why that, those two verses got me stuck in my mind when I was very young, and I said, why hasn't there anyone else talked about this connection? Because there is, is the word of one of the holy apostles proclaiming that Paul's writings are scripture, and scripture is only used in this way in the New Testament. So therefore, we have divine inner confirmation that everything that was written by the apostles or the representatives, in fact, is inspired by God and profitable for correction, for rebuke, for training in righteousness. Okay, second thing to notice about that, in terms of the authority, is 2 Peter 3.17, which almost nobody ever knows. That the man of God may be perfectly equipped for every good work. Now, last week we talked about the necessity of Scripture, but uh, and we didn't really deal with that. But here is where these two things go together. Scripture has authority, but Scripture also gives us everything that we need to live a life that is rewarding, that is glorifying, that equips us, for every good work, every good service. There's nothing else that we need. And I need to say that and reinforce that because I'm tempted myself sinfully sometimes that, you know, I, I, I read this archeological article and I'm going, wow, that kind of verifies, you know, look, they found this piece of, you know, pot shard there and, you know, and it's got the word Dawid on it, you know, and there's an indication that David actually was a literal king, right? Archeology is confirming the Bible. Repent, 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 repent. I don't need the archaeologist 
to confirm the scriptures. The scriptures are self-attesting because the Holy Spirit speaks in them and through them. Now, notice this. We say he speaks in them and through them. When a Christian comes to the Word of God, and this is where it's going to get spooky for a minute. So, Hank, go back to firebrands and the stones until after I finish it. Don't stone me yet. Here's the reality, is that when you read the scriptures and you have a regenerate heart, you have an inner knowledge, an inner awareness, an inner assurance that in fact this is the truth, that there's something more than just the wisdom of men. And there is no other way to phrase it other than that this is a spiritual reality. You know, the fact is, is that the pagans don't see this, you know, there are all sorts of Bible, quote, experts, etc., that are absolutely lost in, in their sins. They are experts on the scriptures, on the, what the, you know, but they have no understanding of it whatsoever. But this passage in 1, second, uh, 1 Corinthians 2.14 is significant. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolish to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, Yet he himself is rightly judged for no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. And so I'm going to say this. It's not just a subjective, inner, upper story kind of Christianity working here. But there is a sense in which when we come to the scriptures, we see something more. There is a power here, an authority here to grab us that no one and nothing else has except the scriptures. Now, we've been fighting this battle since the time of the Reformation. This is one of the major reasons why we separated from the Roman Church. The Roman Church wanted to mediate the Scripture through their priest, through their magisterium, through their laws, through their rituals, and they got it all wrong and confused. And we broke away from Rome because we've said that the authority lies in the Word of God in no place else. And also, we were the ones that that forced, and, 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 and the, we, the whole origin of, for example, of public schools in America was the idea that we need to teach our children to read so they can read the Bible for themselves. We need to have high literacy because everyone needs to have their own copy of the Bible. As opposed to, if you go to England today, you can still walk into these big churches. You go up front, and there'll be a big, really fancy, you know, not like a music stand, but a really big, gorgeous lectern. Sometimes it's got like eagles and lions carved into it. It can be made of uh, like metal. Uh, sometimes it may be beautifully carved wood. In the old days, it might even have been gilded with gold. This great big, wonderful lectern like this. And on top of it will be this huge, gigantic Bible. And then the Bible will be chained to the lectern. And the reason why is because if you actually read, look at that Bible, that Bible is probably four or five hundred years old. It's maybe it even is right. The Bible was one of the most precious possessions, and basically bad guys would come into church and steal the Bible unless it was chained down. But the Protestant Reformation was about making the Bible accessible to everyone. And all you have to do, guys, is just read some of the literature about what it was like under the Soviet Empire, or what it was like in even modern-day China, where people basically would take a Bible that they got from the, West, from the West and they would copy it out by hand and pass it around because the, you know, the Soviet Union you know, had basically outlawed Bibles. But there are whole places where people died for having a few page scripture during the, the reign of bloody Mary Stuart. You know, Christians, Protestants were burned at the stake for simply having a copy of the Bible because the Roman Catholic Church knew that if we actually have the Bible in front of us, we won't believe what, they, what they're trying to teach us. And the Bible itself retains that authority. But God speaks to us. And that's why it's so crucial for every Christian to have the Word of God on his heart. And that's why Pastor Shem this evening had us sing Psalm 1. Remember that? For those of you who came. And Psalm, Psalm 119, excuse me, uh, 1 and following. Verses 9 and 11 are important. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. Thy word I have hid or treasured in my heart that I might not sin against thee. In the word, as I've said before, pure there, it doesn't mean what I thought it meant when I was 19 years old and first memorized. Oh, this will help all those bad thoughts in my head. But that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is that how do you keep yourself on the way that God wants you to walk? How do you live a life that's going to be pleasing to him? And yeah, that does include morality and celibacy and that kind of stuff, but it's far broader than that. It's how do I live a life that's going to glorify God? 
only by keeping God's word on my heart. And it has the authority to bind our hearts. Okay, moving on from there. In line with that, traditionally, uh, even Reformed scholars have basically said that Scripture is what's called self-attesting. If you ever sat down with pagans uh, or people that are not religious and you're talking about the Bible and they'll say, well, how do you know the Bible is true? Well, there's a couple of answers to that. And one of those answers we're going to do when we finish this series here, we're going to start doing a series on apologetics. How do we answer those kinds of questions? And I think we'll have fun doing it. How do we answer the objections that pagans raise to our faith? So in one sense, there are things that we can say to them. How do you know the Bible? How can you prove the Bible is the Word of God? And there, we're not just stuck with you've got to accept that by faith. But from our perspective, when we look at this, we need to understand something. The Bible is self-attesting. You can't prove the Bible by appealing to some other standard, because then that standard, by definition, would become superior to the Bible. For example... When I was very young, and I had that very question, that was a real issue for me. I struggled with it for a number of years. How do I know the Bible is true? Because I had read too much. And I had read about, you know, well, you know, the Bible has been changed, and there's all these different versions, and what about these manuscripts, and there's all this weird stuff. How do I know that the Bible that I'm reading, it really is the Bible that God wants me to read? Maybe somebody changed something. And what messed my head up is that I got to know a bunch of Jehovah's Witnesses, and I actually looked at their Bible, and they had deliberately changed things when it would prove inconvenient to their theology. So how do I know that? So I tried looking at, like, Josh McDowell's evidential approach. Well, I'm going to appeal to, to history. I'm going to appeal to reason. I'm going to appeal to the, the documentary evidence. And those are all good things. But I didn't realize what I was doing is that basically I'm saying man's reason will make the judgment. Man will determine whether or not this is the Word of God. I'll use my scholarly skills, my linguistic skills, my rational argumentative skills, and I will prove that the Word of God. So I'm basically, I've just decided that I am God, because I'm going to sit in judgment on His Word. We can't do that. Now, we don't necessarily say this to the pagan, and we'll talk about why that is sometime later, but we basically have to remember that God's Word is the ultimate and final authority. And the more that you actually read the scriptures, the more that you immerse yourself in it, the more that you allow it to become the standard and judge other things rather than let the scriptures be judged, the more that I have no other way of saying it this, the more convinced you'll become that this word is supernatural, it is powerful, it is true, it is real. You know what? I have, still have some remaining questions about certain events. There are certain things in scripture where it's reported one thing here and then it's reported some way over there, and I go, hmm. I'm not exactly sure how those two things match up. I don't really get how. There's things about the, the, uh, some of the genealogies, for example, and some of the numbers that are used, in, especially in the Old Testament. Uh, there are various things that I go, I'm not exactly sure how all of this fits together. But then again, you know, I'm the guy that couldn't put an ink cartridge back into his printer until Henry came over and did it for me. Four days I worked trying to put an ink cartridge in, and I couldn't get it in. So who am I to say, because I don't understand how these two things come together, that somehow that, that means that there's a discrepancy, or there's a problem in Scripture. It's not true. God's Word is self-attested. Now, when we talk to the pagan, we can take the questions that they throw at us, especially if they're, if they're good questions, and we can show them why those questions are bad. But that's different from how we should approach it ourselves. <clears throat> Therefore, the implication of the authority of Scripture <coughs> is that if we disbelieve, ignore, or disobey any word of Scripture, it's essentially the same as doing the same to God. Remember, we spent a whole couple of weeks on the truthfulness of God. God is the standard of truth. He is the definition of truth. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw that this week, but uh, there was an article of Lou Rockwell that was incredibly interesting, and, and it is about someplace in Oklahoma where about 100 years ago, 120, so something years ago, they made a... Um, a major archaeological find down in the substrata that had to do with the type of uh, spear and arrow points. And basically what that archaeological find says, demonstrates, is that men were on the North American continent something like 500,000 years ago. Okay, let's put quotation marks around that figure for just a second. 
Well, according to the best anthropological studies available today, you know, the Clovis people were the first people, the Clovis is a, is a type of arrowhead. The Clovis are the first ones here, and they're only about 12 to 15,000 years ago. So they're pushing back the entrance of human beings, and basically when scientists find this evidence, they basically deny it. They overturn it. They don't believe it. They don't accept it because it would overturn all of their theories. It would basically make every single North American cultural anthropologist obsolete if they accepted the findings. Now, when I said 500,000, you know, remember, numbers in me, okay, are sometimes a little weird. Decimal points are, are these great mystery things that that only scientists and physicists and mathematicians really understand. So I sometimes get confused. But it was some incredible number that goes between the two. And I thought that's incredibly interesting. Basically, what we're recognizing is that all the things that the anthropologists have been telling us for the last hundred years about the settlement of America is wrong, dead wrong. And they're being forced to admit it. There are these sites in Peru and Chile that are basically, they're demonstrating that there were human beings there, living, breathing, hunting, setting families, you know, 50,000 years before anyone is willing to recognize they were there. The entire anthropological system is collapsing around them. So when I hear them say that they were human beings walking around in North America 100,000 years ago, and that's the assured results of modern anthropology, I just laugh. You know, it doesn't bother me. I think, you know, there were some people walking around well before anyone in here, you know, today is willing to recognize it. I don't think it was 100,000 or 200,000 or 500,000 years ago. I don't think we could fit, you know, stretch scripture to fit. But if you're actually going to believe the Bible, the world is probably no more than 10,000 years old. Now that puts us at odds with every physicist, with every geologist, with every anthropologist, with every biologist who lives in the world today who believes the world is billions and billions of years old. But you know what? That's just I just proved to you that these guys don't know what they're talking about. They had all their carefully constructed theories, and somebody digging in the dirt has come up with something that proved them all wrong. And rather than admit they were wrong, and start to, they deny it, they suppress it, they refuse to acknowledge it, and other people in other places are having to do the investigations. So I don't trust them when they tell me about the age thing. I don't understand necessarily all the physics involved, all of the, the chemistry that's involved, and you know, I can I'll talk to you about, you know, the various dating methods and at least what was popular, you know, 35 years ago. I just don't have to worry about it. I can trust that God's word is true. If I can't believe God when he tells me about the creation of the world, how can I believe him about the end of the world? And if I can't trust him on the beginning and the end, why should I trust him about anything in between the two? Whether we like it or not, the Bible comes to us as a whole. And I admit that sometimes I have to say I don't get it. It would be a lot more comfortable if the Bible would allow me to believe in billions of years and that kind of stuff. Because I wouldn't, you know, I'd probably get more jobs in universities and colleges because, you know, when we talk about such things, and, oh, you're a Christian, you don't have to be one of those creations, do you? Yeah, I am. Oh, thank you for applying. So nice to have you here, you know. Um, but it doesn't matter. God's word is God's word. And I will not disbelieve it. We cannot disbelieve it because that's the same as this breaking down. Okay, questions or comments, anyone? Remember the phrase, scripture is self-attesting. One of the things that I really like about the answer to the Genesis ministry is that they're presuppositionalists oh, yeah. in terms of the scripture. And uh, that was so refreshing to find it. So they have a whole it's three videos, and the, basically the whole thing is what is the best evidence that, you know, God exists? What is the best evidence that, you know, salvation is It goes through, you know, what is the best evidence that we're creating around the evolution? And they go through all these different animals, but at the end of every video, basically what they say is you don't need any of that. The best evidence that God exists is the word of God. Yeah. <laughs> God was there from the beginning. He knows what happened. He gave it to us. You've got the story right there from the best witness possible. And we and we, we have to make that particular statement. It's our job to understand what the scriptures say, and then we interpret science in light of it. 
The problem that we keep going into is that we end up picking up on what the culture does, believing that, and then making the scriptures fit. The whole thing about Galileo, you know where that came from? It's because the Roman Catholic Church had bought into Aristotelian cosmology. They were basing their the, they were basing their their view of science on what the ancient Greeks, because the ancient Greeks at that point had been the standard. So they reinterpreted the Bible in light of what the ancient Greeks taught. So when Galileo came up and said, "Oh, dude, it moves," you know, uh, you know, it's uh, sorry, wrong. You know, he was oppressed. Well, he was pretty oppressed. He ended up spending a very nice vacation, a nice retirement. That's all it was. They forced him to retire. That was the extent. He wasn't persecuted or tortured or anything like that. But they make a big deal about it. But the fact is, is that you know when people then embraced, you know, uh, Copernican or Galileo's theories of cosmology, that led to a whole host of other things. And we need to be really careful about that. Don't let the world squeeze us into its image. That's the problem. Father, we thank you for your blessings, your grace, your goodness, your mercy, your love, and all things that come from your hand. Father, protect our hearts. Lord, there's so much out there that wants to, to twist and distort your truth to, to lead us astray. So, Father, give us that love for your word, and especially, Lord, for our children. Protect them, O oh Lord, from those ideas. Let them internalize your word. Let them see its grace, its glory. It's power because it reflects you. And Father, we are not bibliophiles. We don't worship the scriptures. But Lord, we honor them because they are your word, your expression. So Father, give us grace as we study them, as we learn them. And Lord, as we attempt to live by them to your glory, and the glory of your son Jesus, in whose name we pray. Okay.